So what do we all know about taxes? Well, we know this much. You're not paying enough. That's right. You're not paying your fair share. And what exactly is a fair share? Well, that will be given to you at a later date after you've already put the Democratic Party in charge of determining how much you pay in taxes. And this is the question that we are going to discuss today. How much is a fair share and how much exactly do they want to take from you and how exactly do they plan to do it? All that coming up next on this episode of Making the Argument, where we make the arguments to defend a free society. So it happened again. I was at a forum because I'm, you know, in the Virginia House of Delegates and someone's running against me. And we got asked a question about balanced budgets and taxation and whatnot. And, um, and the very nice lady who's running against me put it out there that we, we need a higher corporate income tax rate because, we, or excuse me, a higher corporate tax rate because we need to pay for these, these important government services that are going to make all of our lives better. And it, it, was, it was the typical statement of, you know, the rich aren't paying their fair share. Now, who is the rich? Well, we don't really know. They don't really tell us that. What's a fair share? They definitely don't tell us that, right? At least not specifically. But we do know that they don't like millionaires and billionaires. They're, they've made that much very, very clear. So let's go into what is the left-wing narrative with respect to taxes, right? You know, what do they want to raise as far as funds? And what do they want to use them for? Like, what is the purpose of taxation, right? So let's go into the left-wing narrative because there's a couple of things that we hear every election cycle. One is the rich don't pay their fair share, right? They never tell us exactly what the rich are. They never tell us exactly what a fair share is, All right? What's another one? We need more taxes in order to fund the necessary government programs to be able to take care of the poor and provide for essential government services. And uh, the latest one that they're very, very passionate about is that we need to not just tax things like income or property or sales. No, no, no. Now we need to tax wealth. Right? They need to tax actually wealth. So what does that mean to tax your wealth? Well, I want you to think about not just what you make. I don't want you to think about just like your, your property taxes and things like that. Now I want you to think about everything that you own with respect to, could be everything from a valuable painting, could be a family heirloom, could be stocks, could be other property or land that you own. That's your, that's your total wealth. Now, granted, you haven't recently picked your painting off the wall and sold it at auction. Because if you had done that, you would have paid taxes on that income that was taken in. But no, no, no. As with the painting hanging on your wall, they want to tax that, right? That's what a wealth tax is. Your stocks that are still in the stock market, right? You, you haven't realized any gain from them. They want to tax that. Now, they claim they only want to do it for the super wealthy, right? And they have some numbers on what constitutes super wealthy. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at... Why does the left want to tax so much? Why are they so obsessed with government confiscation of wealth? And then we're going to talk about what are the different ways that they plan to do it. And here's what we're going to go into. I want to talk about why every single tax plan that they have, every single tax scheme that they have hurts the poor. That's right. Right? Not, not hurts the wealthy. We already know how it hurts the wealthy or the middle class. I want to talk specifically on how this hurts, how their tax policy hurts the very people that they claim to want to help with their tax strategy. So let's go into it, all right? Now, there's two general reasons why you want to raise taxes or why taxes exist in the first place. Now, from the conservative side, we generally look at it as, well, yeah, we, we have taxes in order to pay for legitimate functions of government. So things like law enforcement, things like the military, maybe transportation to some degree. These are things that conservatives are generally comfortable with the government taking taxes for. For the left, it, it's pretty much everything, right? Education, healthcare, um, you know, redistribution of wealth programs, job training programs. I mean, there, there is almost nothing that they can't find some way that the government should be involved in, whether through regulation or through subsidization, right? So for, for us, it's, it's a pretty limited scope on what we think are legitimate functions of government. It, it's articulated within, in the enumerated powers within the federal constitution or in your state constitutions. But for the left, they, they see an endless supply of bounty where they can take this money and they can spend it on the things that it should be spent on if you greedy people weren't keeping the money you owned or earned in order to spend it on the things that are good for you and your family and your community. So... There's the essential government functions. There's all these other additional government services. But the left actually has another criteria for taxes, right? Because I think the, the old argument was conservatives think taxes should be collected fair and equitably to pay for legitimate uh, 
functions of government, which are enumerated by our constitutions. The left believes that taxes should be taken to pay for a whole swath of things. Like anytime they have a good idea, they want to tax to subsidize it. So that, that used to be the old debate. Well, now there's a new factor. There's a new argument the left is making, and that has to do with redistribution and fairness. So all of a sudden, the tax code is not simply there to fund functions of government. No, no. The tax code now is now there to achieve some sort of cosmic fairness within the economy. Because after all, if someone made a lot of money producing goods and services that you voluntarily bought to make your life better, clearly they're a horrible, greedy person, and they need to somehow be punished by the government in order to achieve greater economic equity within society, right? That's what the tax code is going to be used for now. You saw this actually uh, articulated by Barack Obama, where he said, I don't want to punish your success. I just want to spread the wealth around, right? That's that idea of, of achieving greater equity or equality of outcomes through the tax code. So no longer a question of just how does the government raise money in order to fund its legitimate functions? Now it's about how do we, again, that quest for some sort of cosmic justice within the economy. So how do they plan to do it? Well, they've got a couple, they got a couple ideas. Let's go through them. So they want to hire corporate taxes, right? They want higher income taxes. They want higher property taxes. They want to reinstate or they want to increase, depending on whether it's the state or the federal level, the death tax or what they like to call the inheritance tax. They want higher capital gains taxes, right? This is the argument that you hear where I can't believe that Warren Buffett is at a lower tax rate than his secretary. Oh my gosh, the horror, the injustice. So capital gains is what they want to attack in order to do that. And then now, just like I mentioned before, they want to introduce a wealth tax, which essentially is going in and looking at all of the cumulative wealth you possess. All right. And again, we're not talking about wealth in terms of money in your bank account. We're talking about the... Um, the, the analyzed or the assessed wealth that you possess to include in, in things that you haven't realized any sort of gain from yet, right? That's the wealth tax. And again, the, the reason why they want to raise these taxes and typically the way they make the argument, because if they just said, we want to do this to everybody, people would flip, right? But no, no, they, they've come up with a, with, with a two-part scheme here where they've said on one side, the rich aren't paying their fair share. And then on the other side, they say, and that's why we want to raise all of these taxes, but only on the rich, but only on the rich. So let's go ahead and look at what this actually means. Well, the first question we have to ask ourselves, because again, two-part argument, the rich don't pay their fair share. Therefore, we need to come up with all these different taxing mechanisms that are either already exist or they're going to implement and, they are, and they're going to increase those rates in order to make sure that the rich do pay their fair share, right? right? Because the, the, the implication here is, you're being robbed, right? If you're, if you're just Sally and Joe taxpayer, you're being robbed, you're paying your fair share, but the rich aren't. And so this is the mechanism that we're going to use in order to make sure that they pony up what they owe. So let's ask the question, who pays the taxes? And, and specifically, we're talking about federal income taxes, because there's other taxes we know that we all pay, right? And largely when we hear this debate, it's usually on the federal level. So when we look at federal taxes, Anybody that has a job is paying into things like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, right? All of us pay that. If you're on the state level, all of us pay, you know, that own property or even rent property, we end up getting hit up with property taxes, which is usually used to fund local government. We might get hit up with state sales tax or income tax or whatever else it might be. And depending on the threshold, you know, different people pay different amounts in all of those. But when it comes to the federal income tax level, because that's a large part of this overall discussion, who actually pays the taxes? And that's where it gets really interesting. Because it turns out that if you broke down the entire country, all right, so 100% of our population, and then you broke down that 100% of population into five categories, what they call quintiles, right? So you got the, you got the top 20%, the next 20%, middle 20%, bottom 20%, and then the very bottom 20%, right? That's the quintiles. It turns out that the top 50% of the country pays 97% of all federal income taxes, all right? You, you heard that correctly. Half of the country pays 3% in federal income taxes, and the other half pays 97%. Now, you may be asking yourself, where do you fall into that top 50%? Well, there was another graph, and it was a really interesting breakdown. This was done by the Tax Foundation, and here's what they did. They started to look at who was paying taxes, and they took into account two things that are typically not taken into account by a lot of the other people to do this analysis. 
they didn't just look at the, the first factor was how much are you paying in income taxes based off of what you, you earn, right? Based off of what you have. But the second factor that they actually in, inserted into this analysis, which I think is very important, is what sort of money or benefits are you getting from the federal government, right? They actually included that into what you're getting. And that makes sense, right? If the government is giving you money, then that's a part of your total income. That's a part of the, the, the totality of what you actually have access to. And here's what they found. You have to make over $70,000 a year in the United States to be a net tax payer for federal income tax, right? If you're making under $70,000, you're actually a net recipient of federal taxes. So this kind of begs the question because not even half the country is making $70,000 a year or more a year. And we have one of the highest GDP per capita in the world. So lest you think that we're, we're all in a horrible situation here in the United States, GDP per capita, average standard of living within the United States is among the highest in the world, despite the fact that we have a huge population. If you look at the countries that are actually doing better for us on a GDP per capita ratio, it's these like really small countries like Luxembourg, which is basically just a duchy of rich bankers. Right? So when you, when you actually take countries of similar size to the United States, Americans are far more economically prosperous than the rest of the world. Right? So, hey, we're number one. The point is, is that even in our system, where, where we do have an enormous amount of wealth when you compare it across the world and you compare it across history, you have to make over $70,000 a year before you are a net tax payer to the federal income tax. What this means is, is that we have one of the most progressive, or what they call progressive, I hate that term, I don't think it's an accurate description, but that's the terminology that's used. We have one of the most progressive tax systems because we have over a almost $2 trillion a year in the United States is being taxed from one half of the population and being redistributed to the other half of the population. And the only way that you can get that is if you're taxing the top 20% at an enormous rate. And it turns out when you look at all the federal tax receipts for federal income tax, capital gains, things like that, here's what you end up discovering. The top 20% is paying the vast majority of all the taxes in the country. Now the left will fire back and say, well, that's because they control all the wealth. Once again, here's the problem. They are actually paying taxes at a higher rate than the wealth they actually control. Whereas the bottom end of the spectrum is paying taxes at a less rate than the wealth that they control. So here's the question when we come down to fairness, right? Whenever, whenever you get confronted with this question from the left about fairness, all right, the first thing you need to do is be like, well, this corporation didn't pay this or this corporation. I don't care because corporations ultimately don't pay taxes. Individuals pay taxes. So the real question is, is when we break down all the individuals in the country and we look at the taxes that they paid, Who's paying them? And it turns out it's the top 20%. And it turns out the bottom 50% are on large net recipients for the most part, not everything, for the most part, recipients of redistribution policies from the top 20 to 40% of the country to the bottom 50 to 40% of the country. So here's my question. If someone is getting taxed at a higher rate than the wealth that they actually control, if they're responsible for 97% of the taxes and then the bottom 50% is only responsible for 3% of the taxes and are net recipients of federal spending, someone explain to me how, how the rich are getting over on everybody else. Because that's, that doesn't seem to make sense to me. Like my, my, my understanding of fair, and I would argue that most people's understanding of fair is the right thing happening to the right person for the right reasons at the right time, right? It's this idea that, okay, you put in a certain amount, you get out a certain amount, right? That, that, that seems to coincide with our notion of fair. When we look at fair with respect to taking a test or playing a sport or competing for a job, right? There, there's certain conceptions that we have of fairness that no longer seem to apply when we're talking about taxes. Because if we took the exact same standards we use for fairness in sports, in test taking, in, in going out and looking for a job and whatever else it is, in any sort of competitive environment, and we applied it to taxes, we would have to come to the conclusion that no, the top 20% are not ripping off everybody else. And yet, Democrats insist on repeating it. So 
I want to go ahead and read off some, some statistics here from the Tax Foundation. So they were looking at, and, and we're going with 2018 data because, again, the, the data that you get from the federal government is always somewhat delayed. So we're going with 2018. In 2018, 144.3 million taxpayers reported earning $11.6 trillion in adjusted gross income and paid $1.5 trillion in individual income taxes. First point. Second one. Tax year 2018 was the first year under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, right? This is when Donald Trump passed his tax cuts and it lowered the corporate tax rate and all the Democrats screamed that it was a tax cut for the rich. So what happened? The number of returns filed and the amount of income reported grew in 2018, yet average tax rates fell across every income group and total income taxes paid decreased by $65 billion. So we had a tax cut, which means there wasn't as much tax coming in. But again, it, it went across the board. The share of reported income by the top 1% of taxpayers fell slightly to 20.9% in 2018 from 21% in 2017. Their share of federal income, in, individual income taxes rose by 1.6 percentage points to 40.1%. So if you heard that correctly, here's what happened after we passed those tax cuts. The top 1% actually accounted for less of the overall wealth, but they paid a higher percentage of overall taxes. Why? Because, well, a couple of reasons. One, when you stop punishing people for what they earn in this country, they're more likely to bring their business back and engage in productive economic activity within the country. Who does that benefit? It benefits everybody else that ends up working for these people or buying products and services. That's why their, their overall percentage, like their individual wealth might have gone up, but if the wealth of the country went up as a result, then their overall share went down, but their, the rate at which they paid taxes went up because they're still paying at a higher rate. Let's look at a couple other ones here. In 2018, the top 50% of all taxpayers paid 97.1% of all individual income taxes, while the bottom 50% paid the remaining 2.9%. So just what I mentioned before. The top 1% paid a greater share of individual income taxes than the bottom 90% combined. The top 1% paid 40.1%. The bottom 90% combined paid 28.6%. So the top 1% of taxpayers paid a 25.4% average individual income tax rate, which is more than seven times higher than the taxpayers in the bottom 50%, uh, 3.4%. So what this means, if you're in the top 1%, right, the, the combined individual tax income rate, 25.4% of your income went to the government. So a quarter of your income went to the government. If you're in the bottom 50%, 3.4% of your income went to the government. The top 1% is paying seven times a higher tax rate than the bottom 50%. So again, now maybe you're, you're on the left and you're sitting here and going, well, I don't care. They should still pay more. Fine. Then go out here and make the argument that they should pay more. But when one person is paying seven times the overall rate of the bottom 50%, don't tell me that's a fairness issue. Because how much more progressive do you need the tax system to be? All right, let's go ahead and look at this. Um, I, I want to read this off too because I, I think this was this is really interesting. Tax Foundation said, digging through the data, it is difficult to find evidence that the U.S. tax code is rigged in favor of the rich and corporations. The wealthy share of the income tax burden has never been higher. Redistribution for them has never been greater. And more than 53 million low and middle income Americans pay no income taxes because of the generous credits and deductions benefiting them. Our fiscal system redistributes of $1.7 trillion from the highest paid to everybody else. So if someone is telling you that we don't have a fair system, the first question that I would ask of them is, what do you think would be fair? How much do you think the rich should pay in their taxes? And, and make them give you a Don't tell them what the numbers are first. You make them say, like, well, out of, out of the five quintiles, or the richest 1%, right? Because that, that's, the, that's the favorite boogeyman of everybody. What do you think they should be paying? Like, what percentage of their income do you think should be going to the government? And then ask them, when it comes to the federal, federal income tax, what do you think the bottom 50% pay? Because I, I, am, I am willing to bet you that if you were to take a microphone, go out to the street and ask somebody, if you were to ask a college student, if you were to ask somebody walking out of a shop downtown, hey, 
What percentage do you think the 1% pay or the top 20% pay or the top 50% pay? And what percentage do you think the bottom? I'm willing to bet they would tell you, well, the bottom 50% pay all the taxes because there's all these tax loopholes for the rich and they get out of everything. I'm willing to bet that they would say that when in reality, it is not reflected. That is not the case. So why does the left continually get away with repeating this garbage? Because it is a lie. And if you're going to base your tax policy or your future tax concepts off of a lie, then it's probably not going to produce the sort of results you're promising people. Okay. So here's what I want to go into. I, I think I've done a, a relatively good job empirically explaining why the, the comment about the rich not paying their fair share is ridiculous. Now, again, because they, because they typically don't specify what a fair share is, they can always come back later and say, well, it should be 30%, it should be 40%, it should be 50%. And quite frankly, I would love for them to be honest. I would love for them to say, hey, you're rich at this amount and you should have to pay this, this percentage of your income. I would love for them to say that. And I would love for them to say it for two reasons. One, because then we would actually have something to measure this by. Two, I, I think that it would be completely outside of what most people think is reasonable. Right? But then the other side of it is it would be great to have them at one point, if they get what they want, to say, this is what makes you rich. This is the percentage you're going to pay. And once we tax you at that rate, everything's fair. That's what I want to hear them say out loud. Okay, we've now done what we wanted and now everything's fair. Because here's the next question I have. You think they're going to come back a year, two years, three years later and say, yep, we've got all the money we need. We don't need any more in taxes. You think they're going to say that? Because I sure as hell don't. They've never said it before. But let's look at what they want to do. And this is the part that's really important. Listen to this point because we're going to go over some of the most popular tax ideas from the left. And again, I'm not going to sit here and talk to you about how they hurt the rich. Obviously, if they're paying higher taxes, that's, that's not conducive. I'm going to talk about how they hurt the poor, how they specifically hurt the poor. So let's go with the first one, higher corporate taxes. So the OCED, which is not a right-wing institution, did a seminal study on this, and they looked at all the different ways that governments can tax their population, and they came up with the conclusion that the corporate tax rate is one of the worst possible ways that you can try to raise revenue for the government. And the reason for that is because capital can move, but a lot of times labor can't. So what ends up happening is when you drastically increase your corporate tax rates, people start relocating overseas. Because why am I going to do business in a country which is bleeding me dry in taxes? So you, you pick up, you, you sell off your factory, you pick up your capital equipment, you go somewhere else. Maybe you go where the labor's cheaper, but you're definitely going to go where the corporate tax rates are not going to rape you constantly over this. So what does that mean for the poor? Well, if companies are constantly moving from where they're currently at to overseas areas, where the government is not punishing them for their success, what does that do for all the job opportunities that are here in the United States? What, what does it also do for the different goods and services that could be created here in the United States? Because there's ancillary things that affect production. So for instance, if I'm producing furniture, right? Well, then I'm, I want to use the lumber that I need for that furniture, whatever it might be, but I want to use it from locally sourced venues whenever possible, right? If I'm brewing whiskey, I want to use local grains. Why? Because it actually cuts down on my overall costs. But if I have to pick up my company, I have to move overseas. It's not just the furniture is not being built any there. All of those other industries that were affected by my industry are also affected, which means job opportunities are not just lost for my company. They're actually lost for all the other companies that were supplying my industry. So when you so go ahead, raise corporate taxes. And I'm sure the left would love to, to, to feed you this picture that there's a corporation somewhere paying this tax. You want to know who pays corporate taxes? It's been estimated, again, by the Tax Foundation that about 50% of the total of corporate taxes are actually paid for by us in the economy. Right? So it's not even just the corporation itself. It's lost opportunities. It's lower wages. It's less benefits. All of that is affected when you raise corporate tax rates because you raise, you raise them a certain amount and they start hiring less. You raise them more, they start cutting benefits. You raise them again, you start raising prices for your goods and services. Once you raise them to the point where you can no longer function in that country, you move. So that is how it hurts the poor to raise corporate taxes. And I am so sick. And again, I saw at this forum last Thursday, I am so sick of someone sitting there 
pretending like they're the ones that really care about the poor. When in reality, if they pick up an if they pick up just one textbook on economics, read Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson, Thomas Sowell's Basic Economics, Ludwig von Mises' Human Action, just pick up one of them, and and would actually take you through the process of understanding how raising corporate taxes actually hurts the very people you're trying to help. Let's look at the next one: higher income taxes. So once again, how does this hurt the poor? Because they're going to tell you, well, we're not raising the income taxes on poor people. We're only raising the income taxes on wealthy people. Okay, well, great. Let me ask you a question. When the wealthy are not taking their money and giving it over to the government in order to spend it with a bunch of fraud, waste, and abuse and, and, and other like programs that nobody would actually want or buy within the free market, what would they be doing with their money if the federal government wasn't forcefully confiscating it from them? Uh, well, they would be spending it. They would be investing it. And every time they spend it, what would they be spending it on? They'd be spending it on products and services which supply jobs to people that need them. They'd be investing it in companies which would then hire people who needed jobs. So this idea that you can solve all this just by raising the income uh, tax rate on the, on the highest percentages, what you're going to do is you're going to force them to go into government shelters. And here's one of the real reasons why the government loves this so much is the more they start taxing your income, the more they start punishing you for success within the economy, the more people, wealthy people, put their money in things like government bonds. And the government loves that because now they get to spend that money. And even though they didn't get it in taxes, they got it in a government bond. Was the, the thing is, that's debt. The government has to pay that back. But that can operate as somewhat of a tax shelter. Or they give it to different charitable institutions, which nothing wrong with that. But once again, we perverted economic development because now the federal government is taking money that was in the productive sector of the economy, that was being used to fuel goods, services, and the jobs that are created as a result. And now it's being spent on government programs, which maybe they achieve something good, maybe they don't. All right, let's look at the next one. Higher property taxes. <laughs> this is another one. Higher property taxes actually create less incentive to own property, and owning property is one of the primary ways that people actually acquire wealth over time. This is why we talk about how important it is for someone to actually have ownership of their own house. Because if, if you are stuck renting your entire life, and then your children are stuck renting their entire life, they're not actually accumulating any wealth. And one of the things that ends up happening is, is you get that wealth within your house, a couple of things result from that. One, you now have ownership on something. You can get to a particular point where you're no longer paying um, your mortgage. And now you have value built up in that house, which you can either sell that house and maybe later on in life where you don't need as big a house, maybe you had three or four kids, now you want to sell the house. Now you can actually use that to supplement your income or you can use it for other investments. Or you can use it for when later on when you, when you pass away, you leave it to your children. And now your children have an infusion of wealth that they otherwise would not have had if you weren't able to invest in property. But the Democrats are actually creating an environment where they want to raise your property taxes and disincentivize you from being able to own your own property. Let's look at the next one. The death or inheritance tax. This actually factors right into what we just talked about. So you got a lot of people that have invested either in stocks and bonds, they've invested in property, their business or whatnot. And part of what they've tried to do is build up something that they can pass on to their children so that their children can start farther ahead than they did. We used to call this being a good parent. Now it's called greedy. But think about how absurd that is. You're, you're, you're telling someone that, for the most part, paid taxes their entire life, bought property, bought stocks. Whenever they sold that property or sold that stocks, they, they had to pay additional taxes as a result of that. And now when they die, their, their beneficiaries and their will are going to have to pay another tax on top of things that they've already paid taxes for. And, and here's what's so pernicious about this. Let me tell you who this hurts the worst. Because what, they, what they've said in the past was, well, this, the inheritance tax only kicks in at like $10 million plus. That's true right now, but the Democrats are actually saying that it should kick in at $3.5 million. And that rate goes significantly up to the point where you can have over half of the wealth confiscated by the government through inheritance taxes. Now, some people might look at that and be like, well, you know what? I'm not going to inherit $3.5 million. I don't care. Here's why you should. 
because especially where I live here in Virginia, where agriculture is the largest industry, we have a lot of farms. And a thousand acres of farmland might be might be producing soybeans, might be producing corn, might be producing hemp. But now if someone dies and they've got to sell that off and the federal government comes in and goes, oh, well, hey, you, you three children that were the beneficiaries of this thousand acres, which by the way, that thousand acres is worth more than $3.5 million. We're now going to take a chunk of this. Well, what if those three kids, what if they wanted to continue to use the farm? What if they wanted to continue an operation? Well, now they have to come up with money to pay the inheritance tax. What's one of the most common ways to do that? You sell off a certain amount of the property in order to pay the taxes. Well, once you've sold off a certain amount of the property, the farm's no longer productive because you needed all 1,000 acres in production in order for it to actually make a profit. So now the federal government has destroyed that family farm in order to get taxes on something it had already been collecting taxes on. Don't tell me that's fair and just. Not to mention the fact that if you think you're getting the, you know, the super wealthy people, I got news for you. They're able, most likely they're able to move their assets. And if they move their assets into something that an inheritance tax can't touch, oh well. But the farmer's still sitting there sucking because the federal government doesn't understand how tax policy works. How about higher capital gains? This is one of my favorites, right? You, you've probably heard the narrative that how unjust a tax system could we have that Warren Buffett pays a lower percentage of taxes than his secretary? Oh my gosh, how horrible. And yeah, that might be horrible if it was real, but it's not. They're comparing two very different things. One is capital gains, one is income. I can guarantee you right now, Warren Buffett is paying a whole hell of a lot more in federal taxes than his secretary is on income. So what's capital gains tax? Well, capital gains usually manifests itself in one of two ways. It can, it can cover more things, but one of two things. Generally, it's when you get your paycheck. So you've gotten your income, you've paid your federal income taxes, and then you, you decide to do something that we used to consider to be wise. And you invest in property or you invest in stocks because you want your money to accrue interest. You want your money to work for you. And while your money is working for you, what's it doing? It's creating value for other people because when it goes into that stock, now a business has it in order to expand their own operations or to hire more people or to provide more products and services. Great thing for everybody, win-win. Now, while that stock is sitting there, you don't realize any real gain from that stock. You don't realize any benefit. It's just sitting, it's on a ledger somewhere. Yeah, you might have that as wealth, but you, it's not like you can go and spend it. It's not like you're going down to the local Walmart and saying, hey, I got three shares in IBM. I'd like a, you know, a loaf of bread and a flat screen TV. You're not doing that. Or maybe you have a property that you've used as rental property. And so you've provided someone a place to live. And the idea that one day you would be able to sell that property, maybe live off of it or supplement your own income or whatever else you choose to do. Capital gains is now we're going to tax you again when you sell that stock or when you sell that property. And due to appreciation levels, you can actually, or depreciation levels, you can actually wind up in a situation where you have that rental property, you use it as a rental property, and then when you sell it, you can get to a point where depending on how much it's depreciated, the government can take almost everything you earn from it. So spare me this fake narrative that we need to raise capital gains. Capital gains shouldn't exist. That is, you've already taxed me, now I'm gonna invest what's left over in, in something worthwhile in the hopes that I'll be able to get a profit back from it. And then you wanna tax it again? No, I'm sorry, that, that's not just, that's greedy and it's stupid and it discourages investment. And this leads us to the, the final one I wanna talk about, and that's the wealth tax. And we've discussed this again in, in a previous podcast. You can go back and get a more in-depth uh, version of this, but the wealth tax is perhaps one of the dumbest ways to tax people. Because as I explained briefly before, what the wealth tax does is it takes into account your cumulative wealth, your stock portfolio, your property, expensive art you own, whatever it is, right? It takes into account all of that and then it taxes you on that even though you haven't realized a gain from it. So let's say you own a rental property, you have $100,000 in stocks, and you've got a couple of other you know, expensive items, maybe they're family heirlooms or whatever else it is, that 
under the wealth tax, they've decided they're now, they're now going to assess to determine what your total wealth is and then tax you based off of that. Now, Elizabeth Warren and the rest are saying, well, we're only going to do this to the super wealthy. First of all, I don't care because you're going you're gonna to start with the super wealthy and then you're going to go farther and farther and farther down the brackets. But I don't even care because it's wrong to do against the super wealthy too. There's nothing wrong with being super wealthy as long as you earned your money by providing goods and services in a free market where people could choose to do business with someone else. But here's what they're going to do. They're going to create an environment where if I'm sitting there and I've got my stock portfolio and I've got my painting and I've got my house and I'll, I've got to pay taxes, not just on what I get from those things, because right now I'm, I'm already paying taxes on my income. I already pay taxes on the rent I get from the property I own. I already pay taxes on the stock if I sell the stock. I already pay taxes on the painting if I sell the painting. But that's not good enough for them. They want to tax you while you still own those things. So now you're in a situation where if you don't have enough income, if you don't have enough revenue streams to cover the assets that you own, you have to start selling assets, not to realize a gain, but to pay the federal government. So they are discouraging you from investing in property, in stocks, and whatever else you want to invest, they're actively discouraging it. Not only that, but it's an incredibly expensive tax to orchestrate or enforce because now you have to have tax assessors, which are experts on a whole variety of things that they've never been experts before on. And we've already seen in instances where they've tried to implement this in places like Europe. Europe used to have wealth taxes across the board. More and more countries are getting rid of them. France actually entered into a situation where 43,000 43, millionaires in France left the country because the wealth tax was onerous and burdensome. That's 43 million millionaires that are no longer investing in your economy because you decided to tax them yet again, not on things that they were actually realizing a gain from, but things they just happened to own. It's absurd. It's stupid. It doesn't yield positive results. And when you, when you actually tax all that wealth, you tax the very investment that the poor rely upon in order to fund their small business. You know how many small business owners can't get by unless someone else is investing in their business? It's just absolutely absurd. So let's, let's wrap all this up. And, and on another episode, we're going to talk about what would actually constitute a fair system. What would actually constitute a fair system? We, we're going to talk about the flat tax. We're going to talk about uh, consumption tax, the sales tax, the VAT tax. We're going to talk about all those different things. We're going to actually address the issue of what would a fair tax system look like and what should taxes be raised for. We're going to talk about that issue in another episode, but I want to wrap this one up for you. The bottom line is this. <clears throat> the left is making two arguments. The classical argument they've made is the government needs more money in order to do all of these things that, quite frankly, I don't think the government was ever intended to do, but at least I can make sense of that argument. Now they've switched over to, we're going to use the tax code in order to make economic outcomes look the way that politicians think it should look. And they're not going to take into account your individual efforts or opportunities or education. They're going to take any of that into account. The bottom line is they're just, going to, they're just going to draw lines across tax brackets and say, if you're making more and this person's making less, there must be an injustice. So we're going to use the tax code to alleviate that injustice. But as I've demonstrated in everything that we've talked about, corporate taxes, income taxes, property taxes, debt taxes, capital gains, wealth tax, Every single one of these things will ultimately have the effect of hurting the very people they claim to care about. And it is not difficult to see why, provided that you are willing to spend just a little bit of time understanding not only economics, but understanding how incentive structures work within an environment, within a society where all of us operate to some degree off of self-interest, not selfishness. Selfishness is when you operate without any regard for how it affects other people. Self-interest is what we use to get up in the morning, bathe ourselves, and eat. Everyone has to have a certain degree of self-interest. And that self-interest follows us into the marketplace. And it helps us make good decisions. And it helps other people make good decisions with respect to the products and services that you want. And the more you punish that, the less you get of it. And the only incentive I can see in that, and this is the part that I think is truly damning. The only incentive I can see in that is that the more politicians can convince you that the future of your economic success does not lie in your own ability to go out and participate in the marketplace, but rather crawl to the seat of power and beg, the more power politicians have at the expense of your liberty.
And there's nothing just about that. There's nothing equitable about that. There's nothing fair about that. Thank you for joining us on Making the Argument. I'm Nick Freitas, and we'll see you next episode.